Today's story, Between Rounds, written by O. Henry. The May moon shone bright upon the private boarding house of Mrs. Murphy. By reference to the almanac, a large amount of territory will be discovered upon which its rays also fell. Spring was in its heyday with hay fever soon to follow. The parks were green with new leaves and buyers for the western and southern trade. Flowers and summer resort agents were blowing. The air and answers to Lawson were growing milder. Hand organs, fountains and pinnacle were playing everywhere. The windows of Mrs. Murphy's boarding house were open. A group of boarders were seated on the high stoop upon round, flat mats like German pancakes. In one of the second floor front windows, Mrs. McCaskey awaited her husband. Supper was cooling on the table. Its heat went into Mrs. McCaskey. At nine, Mr. McCaskey came. He carried his coat on his arm and his pipe in his teeth. And he apologized for disturbing the boarders on the steps as he selected spots of stone between them on which to set his size 9 with D's. As he opened the door of his room, he received a surprise. Instead of the casual stove lid or potato masher for him to dodge, came only words. Mr. McCaskey reckoned that the benign May moon had softened the breast of his spouse. I heard ye came the oral substitutes for kitchenware. Ye can apologize to riffraff of the streets for setting ye unhandy feet on the tails of their frocks, but ye would walk on the neck of your wife the length of a clothesline without so much as a kiss me foot, and I'm sure it's that long from rubbering out the windy for ye and the victuals cold such as there is money to buy after drinking up your wages at Gallagher's every Saturday evening. And the gas man here twice today for his. Woman, said Mr. McCaskey, dashing his coat and hat upon a chair. The noise of ye is an insult to me appetite. When ye run down politeness, ye take the mortar from between the bricks of the foundations of society. It's no more than exercising the acrimony of a gentleman when ye ask the descent of ladies blocking the way for stepping between them. Will ye bring the pig's face of ye out of the windy and see to the food? Mrs. McCaskey arose heavily and went to the stove. There was something in her manner that warned Mr. McCaskey. When the corners of her mouth went down suddenly like a barometer, it usually foretold a fall of crockery and tinware. Pig's face, is it? said Mrs. McCaskey, and hurled a stew pan full of bacon and turnips at her lord. Mr. McCaskey was no novice at repartee. He knew what should follow the entry. On the table was a roast sirloin of pork garnished with shamrocks. He retorted with this and drew the appropriate return of a bread pudding in an earthen dish. A hunk of Swiss cheese accurately thrown by her husband struck Mrs. McCaskey below one eye. 
when she replied with a well aimed coffee pot full of a hot black semi fragrant liquid the battle according to courses should have ended but mr mccaskey was no 50 cent table doter let cheap bohemians consider coffee the end if they would let them make that foppa he was foxier still finger bowls were not beyond the compass of his experience they were not to be had in the pension murphy but their equivalent was at hand triumphantly he sent the granite ware wash basin at the head of his matrimonial adversary mrs mccaskey dodged in time she reached for a flat iron with which as a sort of cordial she hoped to bring the gastronomical duel to a close but a loud wailing scream downstairs caused both her and mr mccaskey to pause in a sort of involuntary armistice on the sidewalk at the corner of the house policeman clearly was standing with one ear upturned listening to the crash of household utensils it's john mccaskey and his missus at it again meditated the policeman i wonder shall i go up and stop the row i will not married folks they are and few pleasures they have it will not last long sure they will have to borrow more dishes to keep it up with and just then came the loud scream below stairs betokening fear or dire extremity it's probably the cat said policeman clearly and walked hastily in the other direction the boarders on the steps were fluttered mr tumi an insurance solicitor by birth and an investigator by profession went inside to analyze the scream he returned with the news that mrs murphy's little boy mike was lost following the messenger our bounced mrs murphy 200 pounds in tears and hysterics clutching the air and howling to the sky for the loss of 30 pounds of freckles and mischief bathos truly but mr tumi sat down at the side of miss purdy milliner and their hands came together in sympathy the two old maids mrs walsh who complained every day about the noise in the halls inquired immediately if anybody had looked behind the clock major grig who sat by his fat wife on the top step arose and buttoned his coat the little one lost he exclaimed i will scour the city his wife never allowed him out after dark but now she said go ludovic in a baritone voice whoever can look upon the mother's grief without springing to her relief has a heart of stone give me some 30 or 60 cents my love said the major lost children sometimes stray far i may need car fares old man denny hall room fourth floor back who sat on the lowest step trying to read a paper by the street lamp turned over a page to follow up the article about the carpenter strike mrs murphy shrieked to the moon oh our mike for god's sake where is me little bit of a boy when did ye see him last asked old man denny with one eye on the report of the building trades league oh 
wailed Mrs. Murphy. It was yesterday, or maybe four hours ago. I don't know, but it's lost. He is me, little boy Mike. He was playing on the sidewalk only this morning. Or was it Wednesday? I am that busy with work; it's hard to keep up with dates. But I have looked the house over from top to cellar, and it's gone. He is. Oh, for the love of heaven! Silent, grim, colossal. The big city has ever stood against its revealers. They call it. Heart as iron. They say that no pulse of pity beats in its bosom. They compare its streets with lonely forests and deserts of lava. But beneath the hard crust of the lobster is found a delectable and luscious food. Perhaps a different simile would have been wiser. still nobody should take offense we would call no one a lobster without good and sufficient claws no calamity so touches the common heart of humanity as does the straying of a little child their feet are so uncertain and feeble the ways are so steep and strange Major Griggs hurried down to the corner and up the avenue into Billy's place. "Give me a rye high," he said to the servitor. "Haven't seen a bow-legged, dirty-faced little devil of a six-year old lost kid around here anywhere. Have you?" Mr. Tumi retained Miss Purdy's hand on the steps. Think of that dear little baby," said Miss Purdy, "lost from his mother's side, perhaps already fallen beneath the iron hoofs of galloping steeds. Oh, isn't it dreadful?" "Ain't that right?" agreed Mister Tumi, squeezing her hand. "Say I start out and help looking for him." Perhaps," said Miss Purdy, "you should. But oh, Mister Tumi, you are so dashing, so reckless. Suppose in your enthusiasm some accident should befall you, then what?" Old man Denny read on about the arbitration agreement, with one finger on the lines. In the second floor front, Mr. and Mrs. Macaskey came to the window to recover their second wind. Mr. Macaskey was scooping turnips out of his vest with a crooked forefinger, and his lady was wiping an eye that the salt of the roast pork had not benefited. They heard the outcry below and thrust their heads out of the window. It's little Mike is lost," said Mrs. Macaskey in a hushed voice. "The beautiful little trouble-making angel of a gossoon. The bit of a boy mislaid," said Mr. Macaskey, leaning out of the window. "Why, now that's bad enough entirely. The childer may be different." If it was a woman, I would be willing, for they leave peace behind them when they go. Disregarding the thrust, Mrs. Macaskey caught her husband's arm. John, she said sentimentally, Mrs. Murphy's little boy is lost. It's a great city for losing little boys. Six years old he was. John, it's the same age our little boy would have been if we had had one six years ago. We never did," said Mr. Macaskey, 
lingering with the fact. But if we had, John, think what sorrow would be in our hearts this night with our little Philan run away and stolen in the city nowhere at all? Ye talk foolishness, said Mr. McCaskey. It's pat he would be named after me old father in Cantrim. Ye lie, said Mrs. McCaskey, without anger. Me brother was worth ten dozen bog-trotting McCaskies. After him would the boy be named. She leaned over the window sill and looked down at the hurrying and bustle below. John, said Mrs. McCaskey softly, I am sorry, I was hasty with ye. It was hasty pudding, as ye say, said her husband, and hurry up turnies and get a move on ye coffee. It was what ye could call a quick lunch, all right, and tell no lie. Mrs. McCaskey slipped her arm inside her husband's and took his rough hand in hers. Listen at the crying of poor Mrs. Murphy, she said. It's an awful thing for a bit of a boy to be lost in this great big city. If it was our little Felan John, I would be breaking me heart. Awkwardly, Mr. McCaskey withdrew his hand, but he laid it around the nearing shoulders of his wife. It's foolishness, of course, said he, roughly, but I would be cut up some myself if our little Pat was kidnapped or anything. But there never was any childer for us. Sometimes I have been ugly and hard with ye, Judy. Forget it. They leaned together and looked down at the hard drama being acted below. Long they sat thus. People surged along the sidewalk, crowding, questioning, filling the air with rumors and inconsequent surmises. Mrs. Murphy ploughed back and forth in their midst like a soft mountain down which plunged an audible cataract of tears. Couriers came and went. Loud voices and a renewed uproar were raised in front of the boarding house. What's up now, Judy? asked Mr. McCaskey. It's Mrs. Murphy's voice said Mrs. McCaskey, harking. She says she is after finding the little Mike asleep behind the roll of old linoleum under the bed in her room. Mr. McCaskey laughed loudly. That's your felon, he shouted sardonically. Devil a bit would a pat have done that trick if the boy we never had is strayed and stole by the powers, call him Philan and see him hide out under the bed like a mangy pup. Mrs. McCaskey arose heavily and went toward the dish closet with the corners of her mouth drawn down. Policeman Cleary came back around the corner as the crowd dispersed. Surprised, he upturned an ear toward the McCaskey apartment where the crash of irons and chinaware and the ring of hurled kitchen utensils seemed as loud as before. Policeman Cleary took out his timepiece. By the deported snakes! He exclaimed, John McCaskey and his lady have been fighting for an hour and a quarter by the watch. The missus could give him 40 pounds weight. 
strength to his arm. Policeman clearly strolled back around the corner. Old man Denny folded his paper and hurried up the steps just as Mrs. Murphy was about to lock the door for the night.